is CGTN, China Global Television Network. In the first round of beatings, Wangari got very severely injured. It's like they had targeted her. So she got hit on the head, she got hit on her back everywhere. You look at her at home and wonder, is this the same person? Because she's so gentle and calm like a dove at home. And then she gets out there and the passion for whatever issue of, it is of the day that she's concerned about, you know, she really fights hard. Wagari had the best smile. And she maintained it to the last minute. Just bring them here, they see nature. Yeah, this is nature, and you see natural things. Yeah. This part is very deep. But there are times when uh, school children do come, you know, they are, they are very creative. You know, even Prince Edward from England came here, and we took photos with him here. Do you enjoy the forest? You. John Chege is chief guide at Karura Forest, 2,500 acres of natural woodland in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. He was born and raised just a couple of kilometers away in an informal settlement on the forest's borders. Yet it's only in the past few years that he's learned to love and appreciate the tranquil beauty on his doorstep. Karura Forest is a place to enjoy, to be enjoyed by many. People can jog, people can walk, people can go and visit the caves. They can also go and see the 15 feet waterfall. And it's all thanks to Wangari Mathai. Wangari Mathai was a force to be reckoned with. She was recognized across the globe as a warrior for the environment and a campaigner for human rights. Environment, democracy and peace together Widely known just by her first name, Wangari, she was responsible for planting more than 30 million trees across Africa in her lifetime. But she did much more than simply plant trees. As well as for the environment, she stood up for women, for the rural poor, for justice and democracy. And in so doing, she put her life on the line. Whoever met her, was first of all struck by her as a person, but then as they learned about her and what she did, became inspired to do more themselves. And I think that is the greatest legacy that you can leave, in a sense, as an individual who interacts with others and, and has proven that sometimes one person standing up for a cause is the beginning of many others joining it. Thank you that you give us children the chance to share our thoughts with you. It's not in Germany, schoolboy Felix Finkbeiner heard about Wangari in 2007 and started Plant for the Planet, a movement that now has children across the world following her example. I was in fourth grade, nine years old, and in our class we had the unit about the climate crisis. And during this unit I learned a lot about Wangari Matai the um, Peace Nobel Prize laureate from Kenya, and she planted 30 million trees in 30 years with many, many other women there. And in this um, unit, I developed the idea that we could plant one million trees in each country of the world. In Japan, Wangari is fated as a celebrity and holds one of the country's highest honors, the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun. 
She's particularly loved for giving a new lease of life to the Japanese word motanai, which roughly translated means it's a shame to waste it. It's now the name of a campaign that promotes waste reduction, reuse and recycling. We take, we take, we use, we throw away. We take, we take, we use, we throw away. Back in Kenya, Wangari's vision also continues, thanks to committed young environmentalists like these. That people need to be taught how they can live or coexist together with trees. They're the first to be awarded PhD scholarships from the Wangari Mathai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. Their research has brought them here, to the eastern Mao forest in Kenya's Rift Valley. Just listen. There's a sound, isn't it? Mm. Professor Wangari Wamada used to call this a living forest and the other one a dead forest. And the reason being that here you are dealing with so many living organisms. Human settlement and illegal logging have caused the ancient woodland to shrink dramatically. It was an issue close to Wangari's heart. What we are doing is carrying on the legacy that she began. Here is our own small step towards achieving that dream, towards realizing and protecting the environment, and maybe, maybe in our own small way, become a small Wangari Marai. Professor Wangari Madai inspired me uh, with her determination, with her focus and love for nature. She really demonstrated that uh, women can also climb high in the academic ladder. Work on a purpose-built home for the Institute is soon to start on this 50-acre plot donated by Nairobi University. The design of the building and landscape will encompass everything Wangari stood for. We hope to reduce our carbon footprint as low as possible. In addition to that, there is a place we are calling the democratic space. And that democratic space is a place where anybody can come and say and discuss and create discourse with students on any, any issue in a manner that reminds us of the work of Wangari Madai because she really never kept quiet. Whenever something went wrong, she was there announcing it in the strongest terms and being able to smile about it. I really, I, I, that's what I remember Wangari for. Wangari's own roots were in Kenya's central highlands. Her childhood home was a farmstead on the foothills of Mount Kenya. We are six. We are three brothers and three sisters. And she's the third. We lived a normal Kikuyu lifestyle. That is looking after sheep and goats. One thing I, I, I remember about her is that she was uh, very hard working. If you were sent to fetch water or fetch firewood, she would come back quickly. At a Catholic boarding school not far from her home, Wangari met her lifelong friend, Miriam Chege. She seemed to understand the subjects better than anybody else. And the most difficult subjects like biology, like maths and algebra, she was very, very good. And she would help us, me included. In 1960, Wangari and Miriam were chosen to be part of Airlift Africa, a scheme launched by Kenyan politician Tom Mboya and funded by the then US President John F. Kennedy to enable bright young Kenyans to study in America. 
the original airlifts for that that group of students was about much more than just an education. For most of them, they had never left the country. Um, someone like Wangari Mathai had never left her village. I believe for Wangari, the, the experience must have given her a broader outlook, a sense of knowing where she ended up, a sense of a bigger role that she had to play um, beyond her immediate community, um, beyond her country even. We had not lived with Europeans, or call, call them white people, in our schools here during our time. So it was quite uh, an experience and we dealt with many, many questions like, do you live on trees? But we learned to be patient and to answer those questions because in the process we, we considered ourselves ambassadors. My life changed, my experience changed, my thinking changed. When I left, I was a very different person. I had gone through the experience of, um, of the civil rights movement, which was led by Martin Luther King. And that experience really gave me my perception and my understanding and my challenge for human rights issues. During Wangari's time in America, Kenya gained independence from Britain and she returned in 1966 to a self-governing nation. Within a few years, she was married to Mwangi Mathai, who'd also been a student in America, and they soon had three children. By now, Wangari was studying and teaching at the University of Nairobi. Her closest friend there was Professor Vertestein Mbaya. We were coming from different directions in the corridor, and she greeted me. She wanted to know, who are you? Because apparently I'm the first female she had seen in those corridors. And uh, I introduced myself, and we shared, uh, as we did for many years thereafter, a joke, and we became good friends. As a person who was born in the United States, of course I had a different socialization, I would call it, in terms of culture. And uh, she also had a socialization that I felt was interesting. In 1971, Wangari became the first woman from East or Central Africa to gain a PhD. And five years later, the first to chair a department at the university. The 1970s saw her becoming increasingly active and outspoken on issues affecting the environment and human rights. She founded the Greenbelt Movement and called on people to support it by planting trees. Nobody would see anything wrong with you planting a simple tree. So planting that tree symbolizes nurturing democracy, nurturing good governance. Planting that tree symbolizes protection and conservation of forests. Planting that tree also symbolizes the better management of our natural resources as a country. So it was a simple act with profound meaning. Yet at the very time the movement was gaining in strength, Wangari's marriage was falling apart. Wangari herself was such an independent-minded person <laughs> that I think that her independent mind uh, perhaps may have uh, made the two of them come to the conclusion that this may not work out too well the way couples do. When the divorce was finalized, of course, uh, it is true, certain responsibilities you're now released from. So she had an opening to focus on issues that mattered to her.
Overseas, Wangari's activism won praise. But in Kenya, it put her on a collision course with the then president, Daniel Arap Moy. At one stage, he called her a mad woman and a threat to Kenyan security. In 1989, on learning Moy planned to build a 200 million US dollar business complex in Nairobi's green centerpiece, Uhuru Park, Wangari protested. The danger became particularly great when she uh, opposed the development. It had great economic repercussions. When she had the courage to make it an international issue, which she did when she wrote to Prince Charles that something was being done uh, in Kenya that would not be done uh, in England at Hyde Park. Now, when she did that, too many she had crossed over the line. Her protest gained the attention of the world's media International investors pulled out and plans for the complex were dropped. When that happened, it, it did seem they wanted to punish her. And that punishment could have been very severe and very dangerous. And that's when she did what we call went underground. That's when she went into uh, hiding. Well, I just thought that they, uh, could physically abuse her, and they might eliminate her. They might eliminate her, yes. I thought that. In 1992, Uhuru Park was again the focus for protests, when Wangari and other women staged a hunger strike to push for the release of the country's political prisoners. Police came in and they tore down the tent and they started beating us. They didn't care whether you are an old woman of 80 years, whether you are Professor Angare Madai. The severity of the beating, with the, of the batons, the tear gas for us to go out was something I never expected a government to do on its people. In the process of the first round of beatings, uh, Wangari got very severely injured. It's like they had targeted her. So she got hit on the head, she got hit on her back everywhere. The Huru part, that was the big one. She had fought other battles before that, but that was the big one that really brought her out to the limelight. I think at that time I was a little young and I never really understood what the repercussions could have been because she stepped out so boldly and was raising her voice really loud at a time when Kenya was really sunken into a di dictatorial uh, government. Uh, and I, I think it was partly my naivety that kept me thinking that, oh, you know, it wasn't a big deal, it wasn't too bad, everything was going to be all right. And then later on as I realized the dangers that were involved, I think my faith helped me a lot. In 1998, Karura Forest came under threat when President Moy was discovered to be giving parts of it away to his political allies for development. Wangari challenged him once more. Meanwhile, in an attempt to stop bulldozers destroying any more of their forest, local people took matters into their own hands. This probably shows how angry people can get when they realize that neither the government nor the Minister for Environment is really doing enough to protect the few remaining forests from very greedy and selfish grabbers who are subdividing the forest and developing it into private houses. Sometimes when we would sit at home and watch TV and watch the news and see her fighting for the forest and see her in her full gear and as an, uh, you know, pushing for some cause and as an activist, you'd look at her at home and wonder, is this the same person? Because she's so gentle and calm like a dove at home. And then she gets out there and the passion for uh, whatever issue of, it is of the day that she's concerned about, you know, she really fights hard. The tranquility of Karura Forest today 
is a world away from those scenes of anger and destruction. This area, we call it Wangare Mathai Corner, cause this is where she made her first protest in Karura Forest to stop the grabbers from constructing houses in this forest. And this place, we have preserved five hectares of which Kenya Forest Service and Friends of Karura Forest have already planted 5,500 tree seedlings. In elections in Kenya in December 2002, Daniel Arap Moy was defeated and Wangari was elected to parliament as part of a new coalition government. Then, two years later... The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2004 to Wangari Mathai for her contribution to sustainable development democracy and peace. In Kenya, the environmental warrior was now the toast of the town. And the celebrations continued all the way to Norway. It's an exciting time for me and I hope for all Kenyans. It is um, something that has happened to us for the first time. And it's such a wonderful honor that has been given to us. So we have every reason to stay smiling and be happy and live up to it. So welcome to Norway. Thank you. What Thank are your you so much. What are your expectations for the next few days? Well, I'm sure it will be wonderful. That I'm sure of. It already started wonderfully last night. The flight was great. So I'm really looking forward. I know it's going to be an extraordinary experience. Wangari Mathai was the first African woman and the first environmentalist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. To her countless supporters, she seemed indomitable. And when she was diagnosed as having cancer in 2010, few could believe it. Even Wangari herself found it hard to take in. She certainly believed she had uh, many more years to live and she was an optimist that uh, with uh, modern medical attention it would prolong her life uh, and uh, consequently she was not thinking that uh, she was in any danger of death uh, uh, anytime soon. I didn't know she was sick and I didn't know she was that sick I had heard that she had been in hospital in the U.S., but because I was seeing her and she was actively engaged in that meeting, I didn't realize how sick she was, because that was like almost three months before she passed away. But at that time, in all her sickness, she was telling that group, whatever you need me to do, just let me, use me. Whatever you need me to do, let me know. This photograph was taken three weeks before she died. And you can see her smile. Because I think Wagari had the best smile. And she maintained it to the last minute. Wangari Mathai's death at the age of 71 brought tributes from around the world. 
but perhaps the biggest tribute of all is that people all over the globe have been inspired by her vision. Single-handedly, Wangari saved this Uhuru Park. Single-handedly. She understood the issues. She understood the environmental impact. She understood the impact for ordinary Kenyans who use this park long before any of us did. And single-handedly, she fought the state. The, the reason why I love coming back here now, it's really symbolic of her strength. A woman's strength, a one woman's strength. Seeing people walking freely here, seeing people sleeping here, and seeing trees growing, and half of these trees, of course, Wangari has been part of planting, is really a sign of Wangari's legend and life and what she wanted to leave behind. After Wangari rescued Karura Forest from developers, local people got together to make it pristine and safe. I love Karura Forest because it's only two minutes away from the city and uh, nowhere else in the world you find a place like this where you get butterflies, everything, all the nature, the waterfalls and stuff within the city. It's 100% kudos to Wangari Matai. I wish she lived to see this. It's my first time in Karura Forest. It's beautiful, it's amazing. I can't believe I've been missing all of this. It's very refreshing just to be able to come to a place that is so tranquil. I don't think there's anybody that we can thank more than Wangari Madai. She's done a tremendous job. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome. Most of the jobs in the forest have gone to people living in nearby informal settlements, many of whom hadn't been able to find work for years. Local communities are encouraged to set up income generating projects such as beekeeping and education programs for schools, team building activities and community events are a regular feature. One, two, three, go. Today we have a Karura forest that is not only in a sense still there as a forest, it is also now a place where people are returning to. It has been fenced, it is part of a community forestry managed system together with the Kenyan Forest Service that ensures that this place becomes one of the lungs of the city, one of the public spaces for people to go to, to enjoy and to learn about nature, and above all for young people to also have access to nature. And I think Karura Forest may be the living green legacy of Wangari that will live alongside the many others, including the Wangari Mata Institute. And I think it is a tribute to the people of Kenya, and particularly those who stepped alongside her to make this forest a legacy for generations to come in this city. The late Professor Wangari Mathai is the one who fought for this forest. And if it was not her effort, we could not be enjoying the fresh air we are enjoying this day.